University. Uh, my name is Jessica Prada. I'm the faculty advisor for this section this summer. And um, if you're a guest tonight, a very, very special welcome to you. Uh, and thank you so much for being here. Before we dive in, let me give you a little bit of an overview about the course. So the capstone workshop in the sustainability management program takes the place of a master's thesis in the program. And the students work for a real life client. Tonight it was the World Wildlife Fund uh, doing actual sustainability projects. There are really two objectives to doing this work. Uh, the first is to integrate knowledge uh, in the skills of the program and apply them to a real life sustainability problem. And the second is so that the students get to practice project management, teamwork and communication, and sometimes conflict resolution. So tonight you're going to hear one presentation. It will last 10 minutes, and then we'll take about 10 minutes of Q&A. And uh, this is being recorded, so uh, if you do have your ringer on, if I could ask you to kindly switch it off. And uh, I'd like to introduce uh, the project and our, our presenter. Uh, so the client was the World Wildlife Fund, and the topic of the presentation is on the environmental impact of fluid milk waste. The presenter tonight is Melissa Mejilaro, and would you please give her a warm round of applause. Hi everyone, um, good evening. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Melissa Mejilaro, and I'm excited to present on behalf of our capstone team our project on fluid milk waste. Um, so with the world population expected to reach 9 billion people by 2050, um, producers around the world are trying to meet demand in terms of food. And despite all of this, we're still losing food across the supply chain. So the Economic Research Service puts the cost of um, this food that's lost annually at 133 million tons. And this is in the US alone each year. And refed places the cost of producing, disposing, and, um, and <laughs> transporting this material to a total of $218 billion. So attributing about 17% of that to the cost of dairy. Um, so, you know, tonight we'll recap for you. We'll start with our problem and scope. Then we'll jump into losses and impacts, um, and we'll wrap up with our recommendations specifically around fluid milk waste for this issue. So um, our client is the World Wildlife Fund, and knowing that milk has both a financial and an environmental component to um, its waste, they asked us to take a look into the region of specifically Albany, New York, and to let them know um, if we, they, we could come up with any kind of recommendations on how to prevent some of this milk waste going forward. Uh, so we have a 12-week course, and in the first three weeks that we were here, we started organizing and orienting ourselves as a team, um, and we decided to break out into four main subgroups. So this would be producing, processing, um, retailing, and consuming. And within each of these teams, um, we look to map the supply chain of fluid milk. We also look to determine the points of loss and quantify it in terms of impact. Um, and lastly, we looked to find ways to prevent it going forward, but really this meant we had to understand the regulatory environment in order to do so, and this included date labeling laws. And so around week three, after we got ourselves organized, we started delving into a bunch of different research material and leveraging the World Wildlife Fund's many different connections. Um, and we, over the course, um, reached out to 50 different people from various organizations as well as put together a research portfolio of more than 50 articles that were relevant to this project. And from all that, we built this beautiful map of the supply chain, but don't worry, I promise not to quiz you on it. And before I jump into the losses and impacts section, um, I just want to take a moment to point out that quantifying this for this region was not a simple task. We left many unanswered voicemails um, as well as work through privacy issues because producers and retailers, they didn't want to distribute, they didn't want to <laughs> let people know this is how much waste we're actually contributing to. So this was a challenging task for us to put some figures around, um, but we didn't let that stop us from building out our study. So 
one of the things we did is we went out to Albany, New York, and uh, we spoke with a dairy farmer out there who walked us through the entire process, and he even let us milk the cows, and uh, <laughs> which was fun. Then um, we also did some in-class experiments where we did taste comparisons between raw milk and traditional milk you'd buy in the store, as well as milk that was 17 days past its sell-by date. Um, and we also did some at-home experiments to understand really some of the in how long the milk could last beyond the printed dates on the bottles. Um, and overall, in this process, we talked to eight different retail stores as well as 172 consumers between New York City and Albany. And all of this has really solidified our understanding of the process and helped confirm some of the published figures that we found. Now the client also provided us with some really interesting data to work with. For instance, he found production figures for Albany. So we thought, great, what a great starting place. At least we know the first bet that 33 million pounds is produced. But when you step back and you think about milk as a global commodity, we can't start with just production without imports and exports. And we didn't have that data. So in order for us to give him a quantified loss figure, we had to take a different approach. And so instead, what we did is we looked at retail sales in the Albany area. And from there, we started backing things out. So of those 10 million um, sales, we then looked and found um, loss percentages. And from there, using calculations, we could back into expected production as well as expected consumption. Um, and overall, there's about a 23% loss rate between production and the consumer. And we see the biggest opportunity for improvement at the consumption level where they have 20 of the 23%. So when you think about the cost of milk in upstate New York being $3.03 a gallon, that's an opportunity cost of $7 million that could primarily be saved at the consumer level. So we didn't stop here though because financial components are not the only thing associated with this loss. Um, so the team built an impact calculator where you could pick which step in the supply chain that losses occurred in and from there you could input the gallons of milk that were lost and it'll return to you the global warming potential, the amount of water that went into producing that milk, um, and the agricultural land associated with that production. And so to give you an idea for the 2.4 million gallons lost in Albany, we're looking at 41 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalents released, another 347 million gallons of water, and 1,763 1 hectares of land, all that goes into producing milk for it to simply be discarded. So Knowing all of this, prevention recommendations became a key element of our report. And as we moved into this stage, um, we have a number of different things outlined in our report, some of which go into um, how to reduce the financial and like total loss component, but others go into how to reduce just the environmental footprint of it. And all in all, we want to leave you with three key recommendations tonight. So the first being there's an opportunity to improve labeling. Um, and this will help reduce confusion amongst consumers. All right now, um, there's no federal mandate for labeling and you see best buy, sell by, sometimes just a date. And consumers, um, based on the survey that we did, 36% of them will throw milk away as of the sell by date. Um, but what we found is these dates are set at the discretion of the processor. So the shelf life can actually be significantly longer than the stamped date. Um, and so we also feel, in total that date labeling is probably not the best way to go in general with this considering milk is very temperature sensitive so there are other avenues that are available for labeling um, such as color changing indicators that will tell you when the milk has spoiled um, we feel that would be a more effective way to help educate consumers on how to reduce their loss secondly um, education on proper storage so keeping the milk at that right temperature is essential in this process and there's a lot of stages within the process and locations where it can end up. Um, so we feel that educating either through the complement on the actual package itself or in-store initiatives would really also complement and prolong the 46% of consumers who sniff their milk before they go it out. We want to make sure they get the most out of their shelf life. And lastly, um, we'd like, we feel that by consuming more UHT milk, um, there are significant environmental benefits um, and it has a much longer shelf life. So UHT milk um, is the kind that comes in these Tetra packs and they have a six month shelf life as opposed to maybe three weeks, which is typical for a traditional milk. 
Um, so keeping that in mind, um, endorsing UHT is a way to lower the needs for the food trucks um, in terms of cold truck transportation. Um, and also in times of excess supply, where such as during the summer when schools are out, the dairy milk, the dairy cows are producing all year round. So um, that gives us a nice alternative to that as well. And so in conclusion, we're happy to take any questions that you have, um, but first we want to show you a brief video that we put together about what you can do as a consumer to help lower your impact. Have you ever thought about how milk makes its way into your morning cereal? From the farm to your fridge, it takes a lot of energy and means, including countless hours of labor to raise and care for the cows time spent bottling and processing the final product and transporting it to retail stores for you and your family to purchase and enjoy. And after all that love goes into producing the milk, more than 50% of consumers throw their excess milk in the trash and more than 30% throw milk away after the sell-by date, regardless of whether the milk has actually gone bad. Date labeling is not a federally regulated practice. It's done at the discretion of the processor often with an actual shelf life well beyond the sell-by date. Yet milk is discarded and sent to the landfill from some stores as early as three days before it even reaches the stamped sell-by date, completely wasting the estimated 17.6 pounds of carbon emissions associated with each gallon produced. But you can do something to help prevent milk waste. Buy smaller cartons and consume what you purchase to reduce your carbon footprint. Always smell your milk to check if it's spoiled before discarding it. And remember, the sell-by date is not the same as an expiration date. And finally, contact your milk providers and local politicians and urge them to fund cold truck transportation for milk to reach donation centers instead of trash bins. You have the ability to impact the earth with every purchase you make. Let's waste less to make tomorrow better for everyone. Ultra high temperature. So the biggest difference between what you would buy in a traditionally packaged carton versus UHT is the, um, it's, it's the time that the milk is cooked in processing and the temperature that it's cooked at. So it has slight variations on taste due to this process, but UHT um, is cooked at a very high temperature for about two seconds, as opposed to I think it's about seven to eight seconds in the traditional process. I can't speak to another country that's necessarily doing that, but the labels themselves do exist. So there's two that we know of and we, were f we found in our research. Um, one is a fresh check label, which um, tracks just from a temperature standpoint. When the temperature reaches a certain indication, it'll change colors. Um, and the other one is, I think it's the short name is TTI, but this label um, will track the amount of bacteria in the milk. So as, as time is passing, you'll be able to know at what point too many bacteria are in the milk and it's reached a spoilage point. So the Right now, it's actually kind of interesting. So the farmers, um, they're not necessarily affected by the waste at the very end of the retail line. In fact, if you were to just take one step back and look at even the retailers, what happens when the retailers throw things out? Um, well, some processor, processors are actually paying retailers despite sales. So there's not a lot of implications for throwing milk out at that stage. 
Um, and because of cooperatives, most of, um, through regulation at least, there's minimum pricing that the farmers will receive for the milk that they're produced. So there's not incentives right now from a regulatory standpoint to prevent overproduction of milk. Yeah, and um, so with donations, it's kind of challenging because most of the donation information we found was actually at the retail level. So if milk doesn't get sold, then sometimes if they have access to cold truck transportation, they're able to take the milk from the retailer to a donation center. Um, but usually donations are not accepted once a seal has been broken. So if you took it home to your house, it's going to be really hard to go to the donation center and actually donate your milk. Um, but in the other areas where milk is not being sold, um, cold truck transportation is a huge limiting factor in how much how things can go instead of into a landfill or just the trash um, to a donation center. So that's why we feel two initiatives on this front could help complement this. The purchase of UHT does not require cold truck transportation. So if we could incentivize behavior to move towards producing more UHT milk, um, then you wouldn't need the cold truck transportation and you could get that stuff much easier to a donation center. Um, the other side of it being that, you know, right now what's encouraging and who's paying for the cold truck transportation? Some of the retailers are doing it themselves in that when the next cold truck delivery comes in, they'll send the donation milk right back out on the same truck. Um, but that's not the case for everyone and there aren't a lot of incentives in place around that. So that's an opportunity going forward. Definitely great questions. Um, so we'll start with the first one. <laughs> so, um, so from the Hawthorne Valley perspective, they're a really unique farm in that they're a biodynamic farm. Um, so they're producing per cow a lot less than say a traditional dairy farm would um, based on their responsible practices and the way that they manage the farm itself. So that could be contributing to why they have to make that decision between cheese and yogurt and that other products. But that was outside of the scope of our project, so we didn't look too deeply into that. And great point about the UHT stuff. Um, there is environmental components associated with the packaging, but at the same time, I feel like right now there's not enough economy of scale for them to put a lot more research behind it, given the limited amount of purchasing we do of it. I mean, less than 10% of milk sales in the US are going towards UHT. So I think if we could start a movement from the waste perspective to try and channel that, then the rest of the research would come that could help improve some of that um, environmental footprint around that. So it's a great question. Yeah, no, great question. Um, so we didn't talk directly to retailers about that, but we also feel like that ties in less on the retail end and more on consumer behavior end. 
um, because retailers are ordering what <coughs> their stores are selling. So if we only buy the half gallons, they will order more half gallons, and they track that through this point of sale order system. So they're pretty aware of what people want. Um, so if, if we wanted to change the sizes that people are buying, it starts on the demand side, um, and then the rest will flow back up the supply chain. Um, but it's a good question. I think it really drives home consumer behavior about, you know, did you really need that full gallon of milk or could we have gotten away with a half gallon and then gone back to the store next week to see if we could get the other five? actually has less to do with the type of milk and more to do with the processor. So the processor, it's at their choice as to how they date label their prod their all their cartons. Um, so you'll find that in some stores it might be best by here, in other stores it's sell by, and it has to do with who, where are they getting their milk from. Um, there's really only four processors in the Albany area, so you'll find trends amongst milk stores based on what those processors are doing. So we talked to 172 consumers, um, and in that process, we found that 36% of them um, throw milk away as soon as that date hits. It doesn't matter. They don't, they, they don't care. As soon as that date hits, it's over for them. They don't have any interest in drinking it, and it's a fear that the milk has expired, um, regardless of what's written on the package. Versus another 46% of people told us that they sniff their milk before they throw it out, so that's always a good thing. Um, and then the last percentage told us that they don't throw away milk, so. So if you were in this class, can you just raise your hand? So hats off to you guys. It's a great project. We hope that all of you enjoyed. Uh, if you would please uh, indulge yourselves in some of the snacks in the back. And thank you so much for coming out. And congratulations.